Hello, good day from uh, Oxford, Sai Business School. So uh, it's a lovely sunny day here at last, and I hope it's uh, the same where you are. So today we have a webinar around the topic of private equity. Uh, we're glad to be joined by Professor Tim Jenkinson, who is the director of the Private Equity Institute here at Oxford and also of the uh, the Oxford Private Equity Program, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit as well towards the end of this presentation. Uh, today, we are hoping that this will be a fairly interactive webinar. So uh, with that, you should see in front of you a panel where you can ask uh, questions. Please feel free to enter any comments, questions uh, in there as we go along. Uh, and we will have some as we go through, and then maybe a, a couple at the end as well. But, but please, as if anything uh, occurs to you is questions as we go, then please enter those into the panel in front of you. The format for today will be, I'll do a couple of minutes intro, uh, I'll hand it over to Professor Jenkinson in, in, in two minutes. Uh, Tim will talk for about 20, 25 minutes, uh, maybe longer with, with questions, uh, and then we'll have five minutes or so at the end summarizing the Oxford Private Equity Programme, uh, plans for that for this June, which is coming up, uh, and it's also filling up, so if you are interested in that, then please consider applying over the, ne over the next two weeks by the end of April. Uh, also, want to ask questions. Uh, we can see on on the, the chat here. So, if anybody has uh, any issues with sound, uh, then please let us know before we kick off. Hopefully, you, you can hear clearly. We uh, have all uh, microphones muted on the system, so we have quite, a, quite a, a lot of people online. So, just to minimise back, background noise, so any interaction needs to be via the keyboard on the. Uh, on the question panel or on the chat panel. So please, any questions as we go through, uh, and we'll, we'll address them with that. So introducing our speaker uh, then today. So Professor Tim Jenkinson uh, is a professor of finance here at the Sai Business School, University of Oxford. Uh, he uh, has been running the Oxford Private Equity Program, uh, one of our leading executive education uh, programs here now for, for, for 10 years. So it's a very, very established and very successful program. That program builds on uh, Tim's research and the research of his colleagues in the Private Equity Institute. Uh, so a lot of research around private equity performance, uh, and we'll be hearing a little bit about that today. Uh, Tim also obviously teaches on our MBA program, our executive MBA program as well, uh, and recently returned from Silicon Valley with a group of our executive MBA students looking at uh, venture capital and so on as well. Uh, I'll hand over to, to Tim now, and Tim will introduce his presentation. Okay, thanks very much, Steve, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, today I'm gonna talk about some of the um, recent research that we've actually uh, been doing on private equity fund performance. In fact, it's so recent that it's not actually yet written up on a, uh, as an academic paper, but it will do, it will do so in the next uh, couple of months. And it's called stretching the brand. Um, and so what we're going to actually look at here is the way in which the private equity um, houses, the sort of brands, uh, actually are starting to move into new types of funds. Having been successful maybe in one type of fund, they might be a successful buyout house, and then they start moving into maybe mid-market uh, um, funds or venture capital funds. And so what I'm going to look at is, is the extent to which um, their performance uh, maintain, is maintained as they move into different types of funds. Uh, and so that's really the plan of today. Uh, in case you're wondering who's behind this, these are four... Uh, there's a motley crew of uh, my colleagues. Um, uh, I'm the one, uh, one from the right, um, uh, but this is also research that I've been doing with Bob uh, Harris, Steve Kaplan, uh, and Rudy Stucker, who uh, have been have been at this for a little while. Um, so, so I say what we're going to look at is essentially fund performance persistence, um, both across funds of the same type, and also by looking at when uh, the the fund manager or the general partner, sometimes called GP of the fund, actually moves into a different style. 
Um, and in fact, we, we, to give you a sense, we actually got into this idea because we've been looking at performance persistence for a while. In, in, in other words, do the fund managers, the private equity funds, manage to repeat top performance um, across their funds? So as, as many of you will know, these funds are typically 10-year funds and they uh, are called fund one, two, three, four, etc. And if fund one is very good, is there a high probability fund two will be good and fund three will be good and so on. And so when we started off doing that research, we actually found that a big complication was that some of the funds just weren't the same. Uh, and so what you found is that, um, that the GPs tended to drift in their style towards different types of funds, which could be different geographies or different size of companies. And to give you an extreme example, we found some US venture capital funds who've been very successful, but then started launching Chinese venture capital funds. Um, and of course, you have to think about how to deal with, with that. And what we did was to essentially went through in detail and classified each of these funds as, as by style. Um, and then we looked at whether or not there was uh, uh, persistence within the style and across the style. And that's what I'm going to sort of focus on today. Um, I'm also going to touch on the old um, on two other issues, one of which is whether performance persistence is actually useful in the, sen in the following sense, that when, when investors are, trying to, uh, are being asked to commit to a, a new fund, uh, which we'll call fund uh, uh, T plus one, um, they don't know the final performance of fund T, the current fund. Um, and so what we can do with our data is actually look at how what they know in real time so we can say if you're if i'm asking you to commit to the jenkinson fund two um which is going to which is going to close this year and you only know jenkinson fund one has only been going for three years and you don't know all you know is the sort of performance at the moment of that fund but it's going to be five or six years before you actually know what the final performance will be does what you know in 2018 help you um, and there's some very interesting, I think, findings on that. And then the final thing we're going to look at is size drift. In other words, whether or not um, as funds get bigger, uh, returns go down. OK, so that's really the, the plan. Um, and it's, uh, uh, I'm going to give you a sort of a uh, bit of a, a mixture of quite uh, intuitive, maybe um, statistical uh, findings, also of some slightly heavier duty academic research, but I'm going to summarize that, the latter. Um, so just to give you a sense of what data we're using, because data is really critical for private equity research, and um, uh, the research I'm going to be uh, talking about here builds on our research collaboration with Burgess Group, who um, work as um, uh, sort of data providers and performance, uh, sort of data analyzers and performance um, evaluation software for uh, limited partners. Um, and um, that means that all the data I'm going to show you comes from investors, um, not from the funds themselves. And we have the complete transactional history for about $5 trillion worth of committed capital. Um, and so we think this is probably the best data around for doing academic research because it actually includes all the cash flows which go to and from investors and also um, takes account of fees and carried interest payments to the, to the managers and also includes the latest um, estimates of the, any remaining net asset values of the fund for the, for, the fund, for the companies that have not yet been sold. So um, what we do here is we split the sample um, out into buyout and venture capital funds. We use vintage year funds, funds which were raised up to 2012. The reason why we don't go further than that is because we want the funds to be reasonably mature uh, and, to, and to invest their capital and to realize some of their investments. Um, and we have in this data um, around 1,300 buyout and venture capital funds uh, uh, in, in each category. Um, so to give you a first look at what um, the, uh, the, the, the data shows, um, for those uh, for those funds, we see uh, the returns on the um, buyout funds and venture capital funds are, are presented in this table, and you can see that 
broadly speaking, over the whole period, buyout funds did somewhat better than venture capital funds. The um, median IRR, internal rate of return, on buyout funds was close to 11%. The multiple of invested capital, the, the money multiple, as it's sometimes called, was 1.5. So that means that for every dollar you invested, you got back a basically a, a dollar fifty net of all fees and carry, carry interest payments over this period. And the PME is the public market equivalent return, which shows that you beat public markets by about 7%. Um, that's over the life of the fund, not annualized. Uh, but it means that you did better than if you'd invested in the S&P 500 over that period. Um, so that's generally rather positive for buyout funds. It's a bit more nuanced for um, uh, venture capital funds. In fact, they had a very good early period up until the mid 1990s and then the 2000s, the, the decade after the turn of the millennium was pretty bad for venture capital funds. And that's sort of reflected in the fact that their, their median IRRs have been only about 6% um, uh, and uh, have, they've generally underperformed public markets, at least as measured by the S&P 500. Um, now, um, what you also see there at the end is the um, a number of fund sequences we have. In other words, in order to look at persistence, we need to know uh, the performance of adjacent funds. Uh, so we need fund one and fund two, and then if we don't have fund three, then we can't measure the sort of persistence uh, between two and three. And we don't have absolutely complete data. Uh, we have good data, but we also have uh, some gaps in it. And so what that shows you is we've got you know six or seven hundred fund sequences for each of those buyout funds and venture capital funds. Um, now, in terms of the sort of uh, the first cut at whether style drift is good or bad for investors, what we did was we split out the sample into three groups. Um, for each of buyout and venture capital, we, we looked at single style GPs, those who basically stuck to their knitting. They just did what they originally said they were going to do and just stuck to it. And they're what we call single style GPs. And we have 897 of those funds. Then we see some GPs who actually um, drifted in their style towards other types of investing. And we call and, and we split those into their main style funds where they started off, if you like, and the secondary style, any additional types of investing that they do whether it be a China fund or a venture capital fund, if they're a buyout fund and things like that. Um, and what you'll see, I think, in this table is very interesting and quite intuitive, um, which is that we see that the, the highest returns are made by the multiple style GPs on their main funds. In other words, the GPs who are most successful in their main funds tend to launch other types of funds, secondary styles. But you can see here that the secondary style funds actually don't do as well uh, for both VC and, and buyouts. Um, and so uh, you find, for example, that the um, PMEs, the public market equivalent returns for buyout funds for the main style GPs are, are 1.18. So beating the public markets by about 18 percent over the life of the fund. Uh, whereas the single style GPs are beat it by about 6%. And the, the, the secondary style of those multiple style GPs is about just under public market um, returns. And so you find that um, the high performing GPs tend to move into those new styles, but they don't manage to maintain their high performance in the new style. So I think that's the first message here, which is that be a bit careful if you're an investor and you have a very successful GP who says, I do you know, European buyout investing, and now I'm going to do African buyout investing. That doesn't necessarily mean to say they're gonna be best at, at the African buyout investing if they were originally doing European buyout investing. Um, now, that's a first cut, but you have to remember, of course, that that doesn't allow for vintage year um, uh, performance where, as I've shown in this chart, there's a lot of variability over years in how well funds perform. This is showing you the average uh, total value to paid in, in other words, money multiple that funds earn, and you can see big changes in that. And so, you know, I just averaged, in the previous chart, I just averaged the returns over the, the, the different types of funds, not taking account of which vintage year they came from. So that could be misleading. 
Um, but actually, uh, what you find is it doesn't alter things very much. What I've done in this chart is do exactly the same, but just do it, uh, just work out for each of the funds the how they perform relative to other funds in that vintage year. And so these are percentile rankings. Um, and so what that means is if you've got a lower figure, that's better. You're at the, if you're, for example, a multiple style uh, uh, GP in their main style for buyouts, you see it says 45 there. That means that you're 5% uh, better than median uh, return. So you actually, that's a good number. So lower, uh, lower numbers are good. If you're in the, if you have 1%, you're in the top 1% of the, of the rankings here. And you can see that basically the same message comes across, that um, the best performers are really the, uh, the, the GPs on the um, launch subsequent funds, but it's their main star funds which actually do better. So it's almost like you have a very good brand and that enables you to, to offer a secondary type of fund, but actually it doesn't really perform quite as well. Um, interestingly for venture capital, you see that's really the case because you find that, uh, you know, the, 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 the GPs that launch multiple styles or new styles have a significantly higher performance. They're in like the 37th, 38th percentile. Um, and even their secondary styles, they don't perform as well, but they're, even, they're still above average, 47. Um, so I think that's the first interesting finding um, that, we, uh, that, that, that we get from this analysis. Um, the second thing we do is just try to measure how persistent uh, returns are across different, across adjacent funds. Um, and so this looks a slightly intimidating slide to begin with, but let's, let me just explain what's going on. This sort of matrix up at the top left hand side is measuring um, how performance this in the current fund uh, relates to performance in the previous fund. Um, and so, for example, the box that I've highlighted uh, in the 1-1 one, one, um, um, sort of part of the matrix says, what's the probability that you were top quartile in your previous fund and top quartile in your current fund? Okay, so it's like, what's the probability that you repeat top quartile performance? And you can see the figure there is 31.8%. What that tells you is if this was completely random, these figures would be 25% each because the probability of being in any quartile would be random and it wouldn't depend upon how you did in your previous fund. Um, and this is a fairly standard way that the industry has used to uh, measure persistence. And for buyouts, you can see that there is some top and bottom uh, quartile persistence here. Um, because the probabilities are greater than 25%. Um, and uh, uh, so, and you can see that if you'd invested in previously top quartile funds, you would have actually earned higher returns. As you can see over on the right hand side, you would have ended up with a 16% average IRR on the subsequent fund, on the current fund, if you'd only picked funds that in the event had been top quartile in their previous. In the previous in the previous uh, sequence number of the fund, so um, it was worth knowing. It is so that the old mantra of only invest in top quartile funds, in, in a sense, uh, makes sense here. You'll also see just in passing that bottom quartile, sorry, the first time funds actually did pretty well as well. So I know some investors sometimes say, "Oh, we won't invest in bottom quarter, uh, in sorry, in first time funds," and. That is, generally speaking, uh, questionable as a strategy. Um, now, that's for the whole sample, but how have things changed over time? Well, if you look before 2003, actually the performance persistence was actually noticeably higher. The probability of repeating top quartile performance was just over 38% in the first, uh, at the beginning. And indeed, repeating bottom quartile persistence, the bottom quartile performance was close to 50%, which raises the question, why did investors still give their money to bottom quartile performance? Um, but that was before 2003. How, do thing, how have things looked since then? Well, you'll see that um, 
there's been quite a noticeable fall in the top quartile persistence and indeed the bottom quartile persistence. So far as it's now about 30% for the top quartile um, uh, and indeed the bottom quartile. Um, so it's noticeably fallen, but I, my interpretation of this is there's still quite a lot of performance persistence in the sense that if you were previously a top quartile fund, you still have about a two thirds chance of being above average because the top, your probability of being in the, in the top two quartiles in the next fund is close to, is about 65%. Um, and so that still suggests that it's useful to sort of know, if you, if you could know what the performance was gonna be of those funds, um, you would be wise to choose top quartile funds. But unfortunately, you don't know that at the time that you have to commit money to the fund, which is what I'll come back to a, li a little bit later on. Now, um, in fact, I'm going to come back to it here, that uh, in fact, what you're doing, um, uh, what, what you have to do in practice is when, there's, when the funds come uh, out and ask to raise money, um, you don't necessarily know what the final performance is going to be. Well, you don't, you don't know what the final performance is going to be. And so what I've done here is taken the information that was available to investors at the time of fundraising in the previous fund and then sort of correlate it against the ultimate performance of the next fund. So this is a very practical thing. You only know what the interim performance is when you're being asked to commit money to the next fund. You don't know what the final performance is. These funds overlap in their lifetimes. And so here you can see that if you knew that interim performance, it, it was sort of, it was slightly useful in terms of the period of vintages up to 2002, so before 2003. But if you look in the most recent years, it's been close to uninformative. Uh, basically, there's been almost no benefit in knowing it. The probability of uh, a fund that reports that it's top quartile at the time of fundraising then producing top quartile performance in its next fund is actually 22%. It's even below 25, uh, the random element. These figures actually are statistically not different from random. And you can see that over in the, the, the cells that I've, I've highlighted, which is that really the performance doesn't differ very much according to whether you'd chosen funds that were reporting at the time that they were fundraising, they would top, second, third, or bottom quarter. It didn't make much difference. Um, so when, if you were sitting in a fundraising meeting uh, and they came in and said, uh, would you like to know how we're doing on our current fund? You, sh you could say, no, please don't tell me, it's uninformative, um, which would be distressing to the fund, but was pro would probably be um, not a bad uh, thing to say. Um, so in that uh, context, Tim, you've got a, a, a GP in front of you pitching this. If you're saying that the, the interim performance data is not a strong indicator, what should the LP be taking into account in making their decision on whether to, 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 to buy into the second fund? I think they'd be looking at their longer term track record. So they could look back at how the fund had act, how their previous funds had done. I think they'd be looking within the fund as well to see whether the returns were coming from uh, sort of evenly across their investments or were very um, sort of uh, concentrated on a few particular deals, which might give you worry about sustainability of that. You know, were they just lucky in having a few ones they hit out the park uh, or were they making money fairly consistently? And I think you'd look at the people. You'd look at the, the people to see if they, if you could work out who had delivered the good returns on the particular deals and whether they were the same people that were there or whether they were very talented people who'd left. Uh, so I think you'd have to do your due diligence um, on different factors rather than just looking at yeah. the returns that are presented to you. Um, so I'll just go through the, the, the similar um, results for VC and then I'll just pause and just see if you've got any questions of that stage. But, um, but for the VC side, uh, just very quickly, the, the performance persistence is generally much higher. So if you look at the, the whole sample, the probability of repeating top quarter performance is, is 45% for across the whole sample. And you can see that you earn much, much higher rates of return 
if you had got into previously top quartile funds. And that it hasn't changed very much. If you look before 2003, the, the top quartile probability of, of repeating top quartile performance was close to 50%. But it's still, in recent years, sort of in the early 40s. Um, and you can see there that, you know, it really has been, it's, it's, a, it's an asset class which has much more persistence across funds by the same GP. Um, and I'll maybe return a little bit to the reasons why that is later on because I think there are some differences between the venture capital market and the buyout market. Um, just in passing, you know, we see really very strong bottom quartile persistence as well in venture capital. You know, 45% probability that a, a, a bottom quartile fund will repeat its bottom quartile performance. And that really does, you know, raise the question why Darwinian forces are not working here. Why do investors keep giving their money to people who keep wasting it? Um, and uh, that's maybe a, a question which I'll leave hanging. Um, in terms of the interim performance, um, there is some there is some evidence here that it is useful to have to know what it uh, how the fund is performing at the time of fundraising. As you can see here, that there's certainly up to 2002, the probability of repeating top quarter performance was you know in the mid 30s, which is well above 25 percent, and um, since then, from 2003 onwards, it's come down a bit. Uh, it's been less informative, but it still manages to predict higher returns uh, for the next fund. Um, so let me stop there and see if anybody's got any questions before I go on to the, 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 next, the next part of it. Yeah, I mean, one uh, question I guess we've had as we've come in is just to, to clarify, is this 10-year 10, 10 performance figures that we're looking at? These are the performance figures over the life of the fund. So they're, um, these are fund level performance data, uh, which for the funds which are 10 years old or uh, more than 10 years old, they will be the life of the fund. Obviously, the funds which are, fi say, five or six years old will be looking at the essentially their interim performance uh, at the point in time. You see the footnote down at the bottom of the slides. It sort of tells you when that is. So. Generally, we've measured for this the, now, the, the net asset values to the end of 2016 for any fund that is not fully mature. Okay, great, thank you. A reminder to uh, key questions into the, the, the panel in front of you, if, uh, if you have those, that would be great, thank you. Uh, another question really in terms of timing, is there, uh, you know, what is a typical time period between T and T plus one? How, how many years is the, the initial uh, fund typically got under its belt at that point? It varies a bit from fund to fund. In the buyout world, three to four years. Mm -hmm. In normal circumstances, obviously after the financial crisis, that probably pushed out to four to five years. Uh, in VC, it tends to be a bit less, two to three. Two, three, four years would be quite normal. So you don't really know very much at the time of fundraising on the performance of the current fund. That's the problem. That if you're only looking at this, if I, if you're, if, if Jenkinson Fund One is 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 raised in 2015 and Jenkinson Fund Two is raised in 2018, the 2015 fund isn't anywhere near fully baked by the time that you're having to decide whether to invest in my second fund, mm -hmm. uh, which is why there's a, an issue here. Um, okay, so just a few sort of comments on that. I bombarded you with data, but now let's just sort of think a bit about what it actually might mean. I think there's several possible ways in which you can explain this sort of trends towards reducing um, uh, performance persistence, uh, certainly on the buyout side. I think that there's been clearly a lot more competition, uh, fewer proprietary deals, uh, particularly in buyouts over the years as there's been more and more uh, funds formed and the funds have got bigger. I think that there's more assimilation of skills, that there's Things that were very clever and, and 10 years ago uh, maybe have been learned by all GPs now. So there's sort of few unique GP techniques uh, that I can think of anymore. Um, there's also been entry in terms of very often uh, new uh, professionals have grown, uh, grown up at a particular GP and they've uh, formed their own fund and that they've been successful at doing that. So therefore, entry and competition uh, and assimilation all go together to make it a more competitive 
um, uh, industry. And you could have size as being an issue. Lots of people say that one of the problems is, and the reasons why we see what, what I've just shown you is that a successful fund has a big economic incentive to grow the size of its fund. Um, it then stretches beyond its sweet spot, and uh, and it could make and it could also be that the, over time the, the general partner gets less hungry, more risk averse as they get rich, personally richer. Uh, they don't their main concern is not to have a blowout. You know they they, they do more risk averse investments and maybe perform less well. Now it's very hard to test one to three, so I'm just going to focus in this uh, size on this time on four because you can actually look at what happens to uh, performance resistance as the fund sizes get bigger. And so what I'm going to do here is we've got to move into a different type of framework. You really have to be in a regression framework because there's lots of different variables which could be working here like um, uh, whether they're, I, I'm going to control things like the style drifts, whether the, the effects only apply above the median, funds um, performance and things like that and also need to control for vintage years uh, etc so I'm not going to go into any of the main details here but um, what I'm going to focus in on is this size effect um, and what you find is that um, uh, when you move into this sort of regression framework you find that actually the performance persistence to the extent that it's there for buyouts is actually only in the main style funds um, and uh, so there is some performance persistence, not only that the performance tends to be higher in the main style funds, but it, it does tend to be more persistent. And so controlling for that is really quite important, is what we sort of proved to ourselves, that it was important to go through and make this distinction between the style of the funds. Um, but um, equally, and the, perhaps a surprising result is for these main style funds, we found no, no influence of increasing the fund size on the returns. So when I speak at industry conferences, this is the thing that uh, everybody, uh, everybody's pet assumption is, oh, it's the funds have got too big. That's why the performance persistence goes down. But that is not what we find in the data. We can't find any evidence that increasing fund size is, has a negative impact on returns. Um, and so uh, we find a little bit of evidence of that for the subsidiary funds, but it's actually um, there it goes almost the other way, that uh, increases in fund size are associated with better returns. Um, so this is, as I sometimes call it, the, bob, the, the dog that never barks. You know, you keep thinking that this dog is going to bark, that size is the culprit, but we can't really find it. Um, we also uh, looked at um, whether or not the, uh, how, how knowing the performance at the time of fundraising um, whether that has an impact here. Uh, and we find that there's slightly higher persistence in the early years uh, when you know the buyout performance, when, you, when using buyout performance at the interim level. Um, but again, we don't find that there's any impact of uh, uh, size on the predictability of interim returns either. Um, for venture capital, um, we find, interestingly, that persistence is, is really focused in on the above median funds, the high performing funds. Um, but per persistence seems sort of equally there for the main subsidiary funds. Um, so, um, which is a little bit different from the buyout side where the persistence was in the main star funds. But again, we find no evidence that fund size impacts on return. So maybe what the investors are doing or the funds are doing is they're, they're not growing their funds beyond the, the you know, level that would compromise their returns. Um, and uh, similarly, we find some uh, that uh, the, um, if you use the, the performance at the time of fundraising, um, there's strong performance, there's strong evidence of performance persistence in the early years um, and lower in recent years. Um, but again, no evidence that fund size impacts on returns. Um, so that's really a sort of quick, um, quick look through this research, which uh, I hope has been useful. Uh, just to summarize what I take away from this, um, I think first, and this is perhaps the most interesting thing to me, was that it's the most successful GPs that stretch their brand into new strategies, as you might expect. Um, you know, it's almost like 
you know, John Lewis, a trusted by us all in the UK for, you know, a particular uh, uh, bunch of uh, products. And then they start having, a, um, they start offering insurance or optician services or things like that. On the GP side, it's the same sort of thing. You, you trust a GP uh, to invest in buyouts. So therefore, you say, yeah, if he comes along and says, well, what, what about uh, growth capital or venture capital, then you then maybe you invest with them. But on average, those strategies uh, do worse than the original strategies um, and applies equally well to buyouts and VC. So I think investors should be wary of those who stretch, of those GPs who stretch their brand. Um, on performance persistence on the buyout side, there's strong evidence that persistence has fallen significantly in recent years. So I said there's some top quartile to top half persistence, which is still there, but essentially returns reported at the time of fundraising have essentially no correlation with the final return, uh, which is a bit disturbing if you're an investor. Um, and uh, there's no evidence this reduction in persistence is really associated with funds getting bigger. Uh, and on venture capital, it's much more persistent. Getting into the top quartile funds is well worth it if you can do it. Um, but obviously the problem there is access, that the top quartile funds have not grown in size very much um, and it's very hard to get into them. Uh, interim performance is actually informative there. Um, so there's a, a well-defined strategy. The problem is it's hard to execute it because these funds tend to be um, closed to new investors. And I think what I take away from this is that venture capital has become much less commoditized um, and that there are... There are brand effects for GPs um, in the sense that entrepreneurs want to work with investors who um, are, have a good reputation in their area, in their domain. And indeed, because they are, um, they're going to work with those investors, they're not selling out to them as they are in a buyout, then it sort of does matter um, who you take your money from. Uh, whereas in buyouts, you could argue you just want to as much money as possible if you sell your company. Um, so that's really the conclusions. If you'd like to know more, there's a, there's always you can always Google my name uh, on private equity uh, uh, on uh, or go to ssrn.com where all my papers are available. But at this stage, I think if there's any Excellent. questions, we're yeah, coming. Happy to answer. We have had a couple of questions come in over the last uh, couple of minutes, actually. So just a, a reminder as well, we do have uh, time time for, for, for one or two more. So if there's any more, more questions, then please do, do come in. I was going to read the first one at, uh, how would you explain the higher performance of multiple style funds? Are they multiple style because they did really well on fund one? Or are they really successful because they're multiple style? I think it's, it's, an, it's a good question. I, I interpret this as being that they were, of course, when GPs start, they're not multiple style, they're single style. So, you know, they start off as a, you know, a mid-market private equity fund and they do the first couple of funds and they're very successful at a mid-market private equity fund. And if they do very well, then they might launch a, you know, uh, a Chinese mid-market private equity fund or something. And so I interpret these results as saying that, that the multiple style funds can become multiple style because they were successful on their main style, which is what the data shows, that they actually did better on their main style than the single style GPs. So what they, that gave them the opportunity to go to investors and say, what about it? What about investing in this other fund? Of course, there's some interesting other questions about whether somehow these things are bundled together. I've heard stories being told that, you know, in order to get into a very popular fund, somebody might, a GP might say, well, you know, I, I'm sure we could give, we're more likely to give you an allocation here if you'd also like to put some money in our, I don't know, credit fund or in a real estate fund or something like that. So you can start bundling things together as well, which may be part of this. Um, so the reasons are not completely apparent from the data because all I've got is the cash flows and the, and, the, and the net asset values. But I think that's what's going on here. That's my interpretation of it anyway. Okay, thank you. A couple of uh, terminology questions, I guess, as well. Uh, so for clarification, is this research based on UK, USA, or global funds? Global funds. Yeah. Uh, and what do you mean by style in this context? Style means, and there is a bit of a, um, a judgment call here, 
But essentially, what a style drift would be is going into a different geography um, or a different stage of investing. So to give a very simple example, if I was, a, and I don't think there really are too many of these, but if I was a running a US uh, buyout fund, um, and I then started doing, uh, you know, Chinese venture capital, that style drift on two counts. It's gone from buyouts into venture capital, it's gone from US into China. Now, I would also count it as a style drift if that, US buyout fund started doing US venture capital as well. And the good thing is actually is that normally the GPs sort of designate their funds, give them different names. So they'll tend to say, you know, this is Jenkinson buyout fund one. And then I'll say, if I start to launch a, you know, a, a, a mid market fund, I might say, you know, Jenkinson growth capital one. And so that it's not as hard as it actually sounds to make those judgments, but there is no doubt that there is a judgment call, and it took two days of my life to uh, go through every one of these funds and make those judgment calls, sometimes searching the internet to see whether they were different types of people involved in the like. So it did, it did take a certain amount of work. Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you. Just one final question. Then. So we're in, it, in an environment at the moment where there's lots of funds being, being raised. There's a lot of dry powder out there at the moment. Does that, the kind of environment that we have uh, at the moment, what are, what are the implications of, the, of this in this high dry powder uh, time? I think, in a way, the dry powder is almost like a slightly separate question. It's almost like the macro trend that, you know, you've got the macro fundraising trend is that we are currently at an absolute peak of the markets in terms of, you know, that it's going back, it feels a bit like 2006, seven again. Um, and what that tells you and overlays this, if you like, is that, you know, generally speaking, when large amounts of capital uh, are available and there's a lot of dry powder available is that the subsequent returns tend to not be very good. So, that's, if you like, overlays this, uh, because I think that that's a macro trend. Uh, and what I'm tending to look at here is relative performance. So, you know, you might say, OK, the 2018, 17, 18 vintages may not be very good, but top quartile performance in these vintages might only be to beat the public markets by 5%. Whereas in a year where there is less capital and less dry powder, then you might beat it by 15%. Um, I'm tending to look here at relative performance. So it's a slightly different question, but it's a very relevant question to uh, investors. Okay, thank you. And uh, I believe we have, uh, we've talked about uh, private equity performance versus public market performance on, on, on a previous webinar. So, so we have uh, that on our archive. Uh, so that, that is available to you. We will also, we have been recording this webinar as we have been going along. So we'll uh, release uh, that over the next couple of days as well. So if you want to go over uh, any of the, 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 the fine points of, of those figures again, then, then they will be available to you. So thank you very much, uh, Tim, for running us through that. Uh, I'll now just take a couple of minutes to summarize uh, where we are with our executive education program in private equity. So the Oxford private equity program, as I said, has been running for 10 years uh, at the moment. You don't have to come for 10 years. It's a one, it's a one week program, Monday to Friday. We run the program once a year in June. This year's dates are going to be the 25th to the 29th of June. Uh, so this is a program that is attended by people from across the private equity spectrum. So we have some investors, i.e. institutional investors in there. We will have uh, GPs, we have banks, we have advisors, we have uh, corporate uh, M&A uh, type people in here as well. And we also have uh, managers from firms who have been approached by private equity or, or who are looking to be approached by, by private equity in terms of, of, of management style. So the way in which we run that uh, program is to incorporate the latest uh, research such as what we've just seen throughout the program as, as we go through. Uh, and roughly speaking, as we go through, we follow the, 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 the flow of, of the money as we go through. So we start off on, on the Monday uh, by looking at the, the LP side. So how much, uh, 
how much of your portfolio does it make sense to allocate to private equity and why? What are some of the limits around that to, to consider? Uh, then going into the Tuesday this year, we are very uh, lucky to be joined by Chris Callos, a partner from Kirkland and Ellis, who's coming over from the US to talk about fund governance and uh, the modeling the waterfall. So where do, do the returns go to? Uh, in the afternoon, we'll be joined by Joe Topley from the Ontario Teachers Pension uh, Plan. So again, talking about co-investments, direct investments, uh, and selecting GPs. Uh, we will have a guest speaker on the Tuesday, uh, to be confirmed, but that will be a, a, a senior, probably very senior uh, member from, uh, from a private equity uh, fund. We've got a couple of invitations out uh, for that at the moment. Just to say on Monday as well, the guest speaker there will be Jack Edmondson from the Oxford University Endowment. So the Oxford University Endowment manages uh, the, 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 the funds and the endowment of, of, of several of the Oxford colleges, which, which have amalgamated in, 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 into one endowment. And over recent years, uh, Jack has been working there in terms of increasing their uh, their allocation to, 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 to private equity. Uh, so the case study, which we look at on the Monday, uh, is very much a live case study and real life case study, and we get the the, the, the subject of that in uh, towards the end of the day to to hear the end of the story and what what decisions were made. Wednesday we look a little bit more about uh, modelling, so a bit of leverage finance, uh, looking at buyouts, looking at how that works, uh, and then we go on to quite a uh, an important topic, which is what happens to the to the management. So if you've got a, a private equity firm who take, takes over a, 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 a company or, or just spins it out of, of, of a larger corporate, then what is the deal that, that's for, for management? And how does how do we align the interests of the investor with, with the management within that uh, to, to incentivize them? So that will be uh, two, two talks around that area, actually. So one, uh, Chris Sullivan from Clifford Chance, a partner with Clifford Chance, will come and, and talk about that. And then towards the end of the day, we'll have a gentleman called Chris Woodhouse uh, from Tilney, who has uh, operated several uh, well-known uh, firms on the private equity uh, ownership, including Gondola, which runs many of the pizza chains uh, in, in the UK, uh, the RAC, uh, and others as well. Thursday, we will have a look at venture capital. Uh, so, venture capital, you know, most of, of, of the week we will be thinking of private equity typically as mid market, uh, typically as buyout, uh, but we'll also have a, some, some thinking around venture capital. Uh, and then for the majority of Thursday, actually thinking about uh, investing overseas. So, private equity is becoming increasingly mature in the US and in Europe. Uh, so in the hunt for returns, uh, going, going, going east and going south. So quite a focus on private equity investing in, in Africa. Again, we'll have a couple of uh, guest speakers who, who have invested on the continent there to, to talk about that in the afternoon, uh, about, about the experience there, what's the same, what's different. Uh, Friday, we will be looking at exit routes. So how do PE firms get, get out of the businesses which they are, which they're in, whether by IPO, strategic sale, uh, what are some of the, the pros and cons of that, and what are the latest trends? Uh, and we will wrap up with uh, an overview of some of the, the latest findings from the private equity institute to think about what's happening next in private equity. Uh, so trying to look in a crystal ball and see see where we go with that. So a very full week, uh, full days. There are also uh, quite full evenings as well. Uh, professional networking is quite a an important part of a program like this so we have uh, several opportunities with that so uh, we'll have a dinner here at the Saudi Business School on the Monday and I am biased but the food here is excellent. Uh, on Tuesday we'll uh, go off-site to one of the, the college boat houses uh, where you'll have the option to, to, to try hunting uh, uh, maybe lose a bit of that dry powder, but yeah, we'll, we'll try, try, try hunting. Uh, Wednesday, there'll be an optional uh, walking tour of 
historic Oxford to, to see the buildings and also understand some of the history and stories behind them. And Thursday, uh, the kind of final evening of the course, we will have dinner at one of the Oxford colleges. This year will be at, at, at Balliol, which is a beautiful college, uh, and understand some of that environment and some, some of the history there as well. So a quick slide to talk about the, the types of people who come on, on our program. Typically, we will look for uh, about 40 people. They will uh, come from around 20 different countries, working across the, the spread, GPs, LPs, corporates, banks, etc. Here you can see some of the types of people who, who, uh, who have attended. So we see law firms, we see LPs, GPs, uh, etc. Typically, you know, we would be looking for people with uh, 10, 15, 20 years of professional experience. So that's not necessarily in the in the sphere of private equity it, it itself, but often we have uh, people who are moving into that. Uh, a related program as well, which is also coming up in June, uh, the Oxford Chicago Valuation Program uh, is a couple of weeks before, the 11th to the 15th of June. So, as we can see here, this is a program which is offered by the Sai Business School, also in conjunction with Chicago Booth. Uh, and this is really an advanced program on valuation for people working in M&A and or private equity. So, uh, we have quite, uh, uh, we assume that everybody coming in has probably got an MBA or a good grounding in, in, in corporate finance. But what we want to do is to move from that understanding of the theory to see what happens in real life. So we have a range of case studies uh, across uh, a range of asset classes, which we can see here, M&A, LBOs, VC, growth capital. Uh, and for each of these, we have a, uh, a partner from a private equity fund or an investment bank that will give a detailed uh, case study uh, of a particular transaction they've worked on. And some of the firms that, uh, that come in, you can see here, include Rothschild, Goldman Sachs, Commerce Bank, uh, View, some very high, some very high profile names. Uh, next steps for either program. Uh, both programs are filling up. We are about two months from from the programs now. Uh, the private equity program, uh, 25th of June. We have 40 to 50 people in the class. We are already over 40 people registered. So if you are interested in coming. Uh, we don't have a, a, a hard deadline as such, but uh, we are in anticipating having a waiting list. So if you would like to, to, to join us in June, then you should certainly please uh, consider applying uh, by, by the end of April. So over the next two weeks would be, uh, would be really good to, to, to guarantee your place. Similarly, on the Oxford Chicago Evaluation Program, uh, we are uh, anticipating having a waiting list there. Uh, so if you would like to, to join us 11th to the 15th of June, uh, then please contact uh, myself, Steve Brewster, my details are, are on the screen, or Sarah Nina, my, my colleague, will, will be very happy to, to, to help you. Uh, we will be sending you an email following this webinar, uh, so you'll have all our contact details uh, to hand. Uh, so any questions, please uh, just let us know in response to that. So I really just want to say thank you uh, for uh, attending today. Uh, it's been, been a pleasure having uh, so many people online. Thank you also to Professor Jenkinson for running through some of uh, his research over the last half an hour or hour uh, or so. And we look forward to hear, hearing from you and hopefully seeing you in Oxford sometime soon. Thank you.